what's new, you know what I mean? Everything comes from something, whether it's a book or from life or, or you know, whatever. Um, I personally, uh, and, and so the idea that something, the screenplay that's not based on a book is maybe superior to one that an adaptation is, I don't think true at all, and that's why you know there's two categories at the Academy Awards: out of best out of adapted screenplay and best original screenplay. But um, for me personally, I do love uh, having a, an anchor point. I I love g g using literature, especially books by people that I you know my favorite authors. So I've been fortunate enough to adapt Cormac McCarthy and um, William Faulkner. And one of the things that it does for me is not only, you know, does it give me a great story or great characters to, to adapt or put into a film, um, it raises the level of my work because I feel a great responsibility to the source text. And, um, and I, so I, I feel as if, you know, if, if I'm given this gift of adapting this book. If, if Cormac's gonna give me the rights to this book, then you know, I better do everything I can to, to, to make it um, as good as I can. And um, so I, I like it for that reason, but um, it's also just you know, one more step of collaboration. It's as if I'm collaborating with Cormac McCarthy, or as if, even though he's dead, it's as if, you know, with As I Lay Dying, another film I did, you know, it's as if I'm collaborating with William Faulkner. And, um, and I've learned, you know, I, I came into the, my, professional, my profession in the, in the film world and through collaboration. So collaboration is one of the best ways that I work. So I, I just know that, you know, when I write original screenplays, I just... Um, I don't know, I go easy on myself, or I, I, I just don't, I just know myself, and I just don't push myself as much as I do if, um, if I'm, you know, working on something that, that is inspired by a, an author who I, who I respect. You're right, the book doesn't end where our movie ends, although, um, <clears throat> everything that's in our movie is in the book, um, and we shot more, um, but, so basically what happens in the book is he uh, <clears throat> um, basically turns himself in. He's, you know, there's kind of an epilogue. He's, he's institutionalized, and then um, it says he dies in the institution. But the other thing that happens is um, Cormac mentions some other crazy men that are in the institution with him who have also killed people. And so I think... That's, to me, that sort of says the same thing, and it says the same thing that so many of his books say, that, you know, you know, Cormac in some ways has a very bleak view on, uh, of humanity. In other ways he does it, you know, the road kind of, now that he has a son, I guess he's, you know, he sees a little bit of hope, but, um, you know, in, in books like Blood Meridian or, um, <clears throat> um, uh, no Country for Old Men, it's just, you know, there are, violence is, you know, just recurring and recurring, and he'll always, you know, bring it back, not only, you know, to the, the present day of his stories, but he'll say, you know, he'll, he'll at the beginning of Blood Meridian, there's some quote about uh, a 300,000 year old skull or something like that that had um, an axe wound in it meaning we've been doing the same thing for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And, um, and so our ending is a little more ambiguous, but I think in other ways it, it says exactly what you said, that, that it's this sort of recurrence, whether he's caught, you know, soon after or, or not, that there is this kind of, this cycle. And... Um, and so I think in that sense, it is still kind of loyal to the, to the idea of the book. Well, we had two sources for the soundtrack. Um, some of the music is, we, we shot in, um, the original book or story is supposed to take place in Tennessee, 
um, I guess where Cormac grew up. But um, we shot in um, West Virginia. In West Virginia. And um, so some of the songs are played by local musicians that, that we met um, in West Virginia. And we just recorded them live there. And we used just the live recording. We didn't go to a studio or anything. They just kind of played out in the woods for us. And we recorded it. And that's what's in the movie. And then there's um, the score like stuff is um, by a, a, a young musician named uh, Aaron Embry, who's actually the brother of an actor named Ethan Embry, who is in um, She's All That or Can't Hardly Wait. Oh, Can't Hardly Wait. <laughs> yeah, oh. Ethan Embry. Oh, yeah, he's your buddy. Yeah. So uh, Aaron Embry is, is the brother, and he did the, the music. And um, like Julia was talking about with, with Scott um, and his performance that, you know, he's playing a certain kind of, you know, character, but it's still watchable that, you know, that, you know, you're not kind of turned off by the film. And I think that was always our, our, our goal, you know, going into this and the way that it was structured and the way that, you know, this character was presented. And then when we got to the music, too, that you wanted something that would also kind of help bring out that other side of the character. The, the, not that we're trying to make this character sympathetic, but you want to kind of highlight the sides of him that maybe people can relate to, or you know, to make him not a, a monster, but um, make him at least watchable. And I think the music really gives, helps bring out that other side. I mean, I, you know, there are uh, a lot of films that influenced me, you know, uh, at least stylistically. Um, um, I love, you know, the, the Dardenne brothers, uh, Gus Van Sant, just the way that they kind of shoot um, are, I think, big inspirations for me. Um, and then um, I really think, you know, something like uh, Taxi Driver, you know, maybe is more of a model for me in, for this, um, where um, you've got a crazy guy at the center, but, um, but you follow him and you want to follow him. And even as crazy as he is, um, he's compelling. And, um, and so I, I'd say that's my model, and, usually, and, and as, as I was saying before, you know, usually with subject matter like this, um, you know, the film would fall into the horror genre, or, you, or, or what we found too is that usually when you have a character like this, um, he's not your lead. You know, you're, you're looking at him through the, the perspective of the police officers or the detective trying to track him down. He's rare, rarely do you have a character like this at the center. And so, um, so that's where, you know, something like, you know, taxi driver is somebody that, you know, goes into extreme areas and extreme behavior, but is still kind of watchable and not played for horror um, is, you know, is kind of a model, I guess. Yeah. I know that, I, I know that, um, Christina Voros, the DP, and I um, looked at um, uh, the Dardown brothers, uh, the son and the child, um, like we usually do. So that you know, that kind of um, roving handheld style was um, something that we were very interested in. And then I knew, you know, just for example, I knew. Um, that a lot of the scenes were going to take place in this little cabin, and not that we we used any of the shots from um, um, Chaplin's. Uh, I think it's the Gold Rush, where he's out in the cabin. But the gold rush, yeah. this idea that um, here's a guy in a cabin, and we had to. It was almost like a a little box, and you had with each scene. I just wanted to, you know, kind of find a. A little moment for each scene to, you know, kind of justify its existence or, you know, reveal one more side about Lester. And, and he's alone, so, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't be, I, I wouldn't be able to do that without, you know, Scott giving me everything he did. And then, and then it was just a case of, okay, let's show it from this angle or let's reveal it this way. And it was like, 
going around this little cube or something and, and um, as he gave us different aspects of the character kind of showed different aspects uh, or shoot it from different ways and just kind of revolve around it so that um, everything, you know, the whole movie's focused on one person but along the way, you know, it's like each scene, because of that, then each scene needs to reveal something more about Lester and needs to kind of push him farther along in his, his development. So I guess that's kind of what was in my head as far as um, designing the movie and the, and the kind of the progression of the movie. And, and, um, and so the scenes, the way they were shot would be, you know, kind of arranged around that.